Welcome to Finance Watch Summer Conference about the future of traditional banking. I am very happy to see again the diverse uh, mix of delegates uh, that makes our conference so special. Uh, so we have uh, EU policymakers, we have civil society representatives, we have financial sectors representatives, academics, and press. So welcome to you all, and we are looking forward to your comments and interventions during the Q&A sessions for the two panels of this afternoon. Before introducing our first keynote speaker, I would like to say a few words about our topic today. Traditional banking in Europe is under pressure from two sides. On one side, there are new post-crisis rules to tackle too-big-to-fail banking institutions. On the other side, there are new market entrants using financial technology to disrupt long-established banking practices. These are the rock and the hard place of the conference title. We have chosen to focus this event on traditional banking because of its central importance to the economy. Let me explain what I mean by this term. Don't worry, I'm not going to tell you that every bank should be like Bailey Brothers building and loans from the famous movie called It's a Wonderful Life. Even so, I do enjoy that movie and this type of bank. The traditional banks that we have in mind are not fictional. Actually, they can be found all over Europe in a variety of corporate forms, but they have three common features. The first feature is that they are focused on their local areas and they use local knowledge and relationship to land in their local economy. The second common feature is that they have stable funding sources with adequate stable deposit funding and lower leverage than too big to fail banks. The third one is that they are small enough to fail without pulling down other financial firms and small enough not to exert unreasonable influence over politicians. Local, stable and small. So why are they under threat? I'll start with the rock. This is really a story about competition. Between 1990 and 2001, in industrialized countries, there have been 10,000 mergers and acquisitions in the financial sector. That is a lot of small banks disappearing. And the sector has become even more concentrated since the crisis. The rules of market capitalism and competition do not apply to the banking giants that now dominate the economy. Perhaps that is why trust in the banking sector remains <clears throat> lower than in any other sector, while pay remains unacceptably high. According to a recent survey, the average, not the highest, the average, the average annual earnings of London-based managing directors at the largest European investment banks was around 1 million euro. The Bank of England believes that the lack of diversity in banking, both intellectual and financial, contributed significantly to the depths and severity of the global financial crisis. As chief economist 
Andy Aldane explained that a lack of diversity within the financial ecosystem, with many institutions holding similar portfolios, created a financial monoculture vulnerable to shocks. Aldane said that in 2008, this old lesson from evolutionary biology and systems theory was learned painfully and abruptly. There is a good case for saying that this oligarchic market structure is bad for growth, even during good times. Research shows that small local banks and co-ops lend proportionately more to small and medium-sized enterprises, SMEs, the real engine of jobs and growth, larger than larger, sorry, domestic or foreign banks. And SMEs in countries with good system of small local banks are more successful than SMEs in countries without such a banking system. According to recent studies by the Bank of Finland in 2014, by UNEP in 2015, and by our own research produced by Finance Watch in 2015. Just look in that respect at the German Mittelstand with the local Sparkassen and Volksbanken, or, because we always forget it, look at the US with the community banks. Traditional banking, local, stable, and small, has therefore something of real value to offer the EU growth agenda, something that too big to fail banks with their remote automati automated credit scoring, volatile wholesale funding, and trading biases cannot do so well. To be clear, Finance Watch does not want to replace one monoculture with another, but we want to ensure system diversity where the different strengths and focuses of different banking institutions can meet the different needs of society. For this to happen, large incumbents will have to be stripped of unfair advantages distorting competition so that other business models can compete. This will certainly not happen on its own. In our view, the EU has to refocus on these problems urgently. The rise of nationalism and populism in too many EU countries, as well as the UK Brexit referendum later this month, are fueled by economic insecurity as people's fears and anger are channeled skillfully but wrongly against foreigners. A financial crisis will almost certainly make this worse. So we are on a worrying track. Another financial crisis or simply more years of low growth will have political consequences and it is already happening. Now, what has this to do with traditional banks? A key priority for policymakers must be to reduce the size and influence of too big to fail banks that are not properly configured to serve the real economy while at the same time promoting banks whose business models are primarily geared to local enterprise lending. In other words, banks that are local, stable, and small. At Finance Watch, we do know that this is not an easy task. Big banks have good lobbyists, the best that money can buy, 
and they have plenty of money to do so. They have resisted structural reform and are now opposing leverage caps. The bail-in regime is some progress, but cannot end in itself too big to fail banking as long as banking structure are unreformed. For us, this view was confirmed last week when the Commission published level two rules on bail-in that omitted a crucial 8% burden sharing requirement. That indicates that policymakers are unable to commit to enforcing bail in in a full blown crisis. We will hear more about this important topic in this afternoon's keynote speeches from Sir Paul Tucker and Avinash Perso and the panel afterwards. Policymakers are taking us further in the wrong direction with some elements of the capital markets union. Of course, Finance Watch support those measures in the CMU action plan that encourage, for instance, equity funding and connecting investors in one country with businesses in another. But we do not endorse plans to give banks extraordinary capital relief for securitization. As we have argued for many months now in some detail, together with apparently a growing body of economists, moves in these directions may boost the profitability of too big to fail banks, but will do little for smaller banks and the real economy, other than exposing smaller banks and the real economy to financial stability risk and a possible surge in real estate lending. If we are looking for ways to promote local, stable and small banks, the one that specialize in financing productive enterprise that employ people in long-term jobs, and if we want to reduce the unfair advantage of too big to fail banks, whose business models are built around totally different objectives, we must go further than the regulations we have had so far. Removing the current built-in unfair advantages for large banks over smaller ones in prudential regulation and structural reform of me mega banks are the obvious places to start. So much for the rock. What about the hard place now? The threats and opportunities from financial technology companies or fintechs are only starting to be known. Among the threats, fintechs are now competing with nearly every function carried out by traditional banks, including saving, lending, foreign exchange, and most of all, payments. According to a recent survey, adoption rates of fintech products could double within a year. The surveyors, Ernst and Young, warned that the risk of disruption is real. The EU is helping this along, along especially in payment services with the payment service directive called PSD2. And yet, the EU is not a fintech leader. For example, only one EU country appears in the World Economics Forum top 10 countries in mobile banking. Sweden was ninth on that list, three places behind Zimbabwe. There are enormous business opportunities here and the sector could and should evolve quickly. 
We do know that regulators are watching. The UK so-called regulatory sandbox, where innovators have been able to test products in a safe environment without the normal regulatory constraints for two months, will close next week after hundreds of applications. The Bank of England governor will give a major speech about fintech in a few days, and other countries are similarly active. The EU is making progress on crowdfunding and peer-to-peer -peer lending, but with most peer-to-peer -peer lending untested in a downturn and warnings around P2P securitization piling up in the US, regulators should not miss the opportunity to shape these markets positively while they can. The key question here is whether fintech will help the financial sector to serve citizens better or worse than it does now. For traditional banks and retail customers, the question is whether fintech will see a flourishing of opportunity and customer service or be quickly captured by the big boys in a winner-takes-all result that we have seen so many times in other sectors, for instance, such as in big pharma's acquiring nimble biotech startups. To point us in the right directions toward a more innovative financial system where firms compete fairly to serve their customer and obey the rules of capitalism, it is now my great pleasure to welcome our first keynote speaker of the day, who I understand has some important points to make about regulating systematically important banks. A senior central banker who has seen the financial system at its best and worst, a leading international expert on financial regulation and chair of the Systemic Risk Council, among other prestigious roles. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in warmly welcoming Sir Paul Tucker. <laughs> 